Hey everybody, welcome to Virtual Grace Church. If you're normally here and you're watching, that means I'm normally here and I'm watching because the storm was as big as they said. And so what we wanted to do was be prepared. You know, uh, if 2020 taught us anything, it is that the most unlikely events will most likely happen. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. And I love you and I miss you and I miss your faces and I want to see you next week because we are in this series, People of Passion, leading us toward the most exciting weekend in the history of the church, and that is Easter weekend. But you know, this weekend also marks a pretty exciting time in our past. Uh, This is the one-year anniversary of the 14 days to flatten the curve. That went a little longer than they expected, right? Hard to believe that this was the one-year mark of us not being together officially. And yet, God has worked in a mighty way. This ministry has fed over 13,000 people and families. We are housing more people this weekend, over 100 in hotels, uh, vouchering them, making sure they're safe and that they're not going to die in this, this crazy weather. But in the midst of all of it, you've also been helping a lot of restaurants. And this week, we get another wonderful, yummy Mexican restaurant, and it's uh, right across the street. It's um, Las Three Garcias, or in Spanish, Las Tres Garcias, right across the street, 72nd, northeast side of Sheridan. So get over there and get some food uh, from this wonderful restaurant, and make sure you let them know that uh, you're from Grace Church I also wanted you to know that the youth group continues to do some of their fundraising, and they're going to have a fun night, man. We did this a couple years ago. It was a blast. I think we did it for small groups when my daughter Brittany was leading, but it's going to be an all-church bunco game March 19th, okay? So that's from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the main auditorium. you got to be 12 years or older. It's $10 to play. Food and drinks will be available to purchase Prizes will be given out, no cash prizes. This isn't gambling. This is actually having fun and donating a lot of money to the church. If you've never played Bunko, it's a blast. I used to, I remember when it first came out, I thought it was just like the ladies game. Um, And uh, boy, it is a fun game. It's for everyone. And so join us again, March 19th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Help kids get to summer camp. Wasn't Jason... His sermon last week, powerful. Pastor Jason, one of our elders, and uh, just an incredible man and pastor. It was a great message. It spoke to me. I was going through some very difficult things. It seems like that has been very consistent for many of us in this ministry, but it has been unprecedented. And uh, I talk about this. I, I know it's almost ad nauseum, like when you talk to your grandpa and he says, well, back in my day, and I have a tendency to say for the past 36 years or nearly 40 years, but I, you know, it's just hard when you've been doing this so long. And I, I can tell you it's been an unprecedented time of tragedy and difficulty. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But I want to talk today about a person that I think we can all relate to. As a matter of fact, it might, it, I hope it doesn't offend you, but I think right up front, you have to understand what I'm talking about. If you have no knowledge of Scripture, I'm so glad you're watching. If you're not a believer, but you're checking things out, thank you. There is a character in the Bible story about Jesus' crucifixion, a real person, who was named Barabbas. And the reason I've entitled the message, We Are Barabbas, is because in essence, He is symbolic of all of us when it comes to Jesus dying on the cross and taking the sins of the world. Now, I don't know if you remember years ago, there was a movie called We Are Marshall with Matthew McConaughey. Great movie about a tragic event. 1970, the Marshall football team, 37 of its players, 25 boosters, coaches, everybody coming back from a loss in East Carolina, they, they clipped the trees two miles from the, the runway, and they were all lost. They all died. It was a tragedy. But something that happened in Marshall University, at Marshall University, is it united the body, the, the, the student body, and they began the chant and began this uh, in 1970, we are Marshall. And, you know, when you think about it, I mean, 
it was a beautiful sign of unity. It's an incredible legacy about those players and coaches that perished. But it is also symbolic of the fact that in tragedy, we can find hope. In despair, we can find a passage to true, genuine unity and love. And in this message, when we look at Barabbas, we're going to understand that. We are Barabbas. Now, the Bible speaks just a little bit about Barabbas. And I want to tell you about Barabbas, but let me read first in Mark chapter 15, verses 7 through 15. Listen close. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. Now, you're going to find some things as I read through this that correlate directly to what we've been going through over the last year or so. There was an uprising. There was a revolutionary group of zealot uh, Jews who were attacking Rome. They wanted Rome destroyed. They believed Rome was wicked. And, uh, and so there was an insurrection. It says the crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. That was Jesus. For he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. In other words, they had nothing to pin on Jesus. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crimes has he committed? But the mob, here it is, guys, mob rule, never a good thing. The mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, we'll talk a lot more about Jesus, but I want to talk about Barabbas. And it is very important to understand that whenever you see a mob stirred up in craziness, it always boils down to a couple of people who have a sinister agenda. Now, sometimes it can be a positive agenda. I mean, after all, this country was about an uprising and a breaking free of the royalty that once held us captive from our own religious beliefs of Christianity. Now, this uprising was truly one that was demanded by the zealots who were Jews that wanted Rome overthrown. The problem is they were going about it, at least in my opinion, wrongly. And that's what we've seen in this country. With the uprisings, the mob rules, that's not the way to try to handle our differences. You don't go burn cities, torch police cars, destroy communities. That's not how you get things done. And the sad part is, if you look at the agenda of BLM or Antifa or some of these groups, even the radical, radical groups on the right side, they all have an agenda that never quite represents what the people want. You know, those, those groups sound like they care about the black person, but they don't. They care about Marxism. They care about their own agenda. You know, the church should be leading the way with a passion and a boldness to proclaim that the gospel is for all people of all nations, from all tongues, all backgrounds, no matter what religious persuasion, salvation is found in Jesus Christ. And Barabbas is a beautiful picture of that. Now, here's what's important to note. The story of Barabbas will not strike you until you really understand who Barabbas was. Now, we don't have a lot of information in the Bible, but we have enough to de determine a profile. First of all, Barabbas was known, the name Barabbas literally means son of his father. That was what it meant. Interesting that the person who was about to be in a prisoner exchange with Jesus was named son of his father. There's also um, many texts that say that Barabbas was uh, Bar-Jonah or son of Jonah. And the other name for Barabbas was Bar Jesus Barabbas. So you could say that one Jesus substituted his life for the other Jesus. Just like the Bible says Jesus was the next Adam, you had the Adam who sinned, then you had Adam who came, Jesus, who died for the sins of Adam. It's a very interesting study, but I think it's amazing 
that Barabbas was named son of his father because the one man who had a father on earth was in prison, but the one man whose father was in heaven was living for the lives and eventually dying for the sins of all people. Now, here's what we need to determine. A couple weeks ago, I talked to you about the fact that we're all sinners. And I know it's tough when we get involved, maybe you're new to ministry, to hear a preacher say, you're sinful. Let me, let me soften the blow. We're all sinful. And a lot of times we compare our sins to other people's sins, and then we say, I'm not really a bad person. I'm not really a sinful person. Guys, the only way to truly determine how sinful we are is to compare ourselves with a holy, righteous, sinless, eternal God. Manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, one God, three persons. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to write this down. Now, hopefully you downloaded this at your house. If you didn't, you can go back and do it later. But this is really important to note. First, I'll ask this question. Was Barabbas a bad man? If Barabbas was a bad man, am I? The answer is this, yes. I am am bad compared to God's goodness. You see, even the good things that I do before I'm born again, before I know Jesus, is evil. Barabbas was an insurrectionist, but am I? Yes, I'm an insurrectionist. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it clear that insurrection, uh, an uprising against the governing power, uh, a person who commits crime, is something that could be really a tag for all people when it comes to the fact that God has a holy law and we can't live up to it. Psalm 510 says, condemn them, O God. May their own schemes be their downfall. Drive them away because of their many acts of insurrection, for they have rebelled against you. I want you to note something here. David is talking about the sinfulness of the people who were trying to kill him, but David himself committed sin. David himself committed some of the worst sins. And, and what that scripture makes clear is that insurrectionists are people who've rebelled against God. We've all rebelled against God. One of the most profound and amazing passages in the Bible, written no less than 700 years before Jesus was even born, or at least became flesh, is Isaiah 53.5. And it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace is on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, I want to explain what that verse means. I also want to explain what that verse does not mean. This verse is used and sometimes abused in the Christian community. First of all, all the in insurrections, all the iniquities, all the rebellion was brought on Jesus. It was put on Jesus when he died on the cross. And this passage, man, I mean, 11 of the most powerful verses as you go through, and there's many others, but those verses that prophesy to the way Jesus would die. He was pierced. How did Jesus die? Nails pushed through his, his hands and his feet. And the punishment that brought us peace is on him. And, and his wounds heal us. But you'll hear people say, Christians a lot, well, by his wounds, we are healed. And they, they do that a lot in regard to physical sickness. Now, God still heals. I've seen miracle after miracle. I do not deny that. But God does not heal through people who run around and proclaim to be faith healers. God heals based on the humble prayers of his people and according to his perfect will. Sometimes God's healing is to bring us home to heaven. That's the ultimate healing. But also, it is the healing of the wounds that sin has caused. By his wounds, we are healed from death, from hell, from a Christless eternity, and we have the freedom now to live in Christ. You know what else, though? Barabbas was a thief, but am I? Sadly, yes, I'm a thief. Some of you are like, wait a second, preacher. I've never stolen a thing in my life. I remember one time I, I had this disagreement with a person uh, that I worked for. Oh, I've never stolen a thing, never in my life. And I had to sit down and explain that 
the way he did his business was sometimes stealing from people. And that was a difficult conversation. We're all thieves. If you don't think you're a thief, then you're lying to yourself. Let me show you why. Proverbs 11.1 says, dishonest business practice is something that Yahweh truly hates. But it pleases him when we apply the right standards of measurement. That phrase, standards of measurement, means you got to be honest with your taxes. you got to be honest with your giving. As a matter of fact, you have to be honest with every penny because it belongs to God. We just came out of a series dealing with God's money and how to make money last. You learn those principles. If you didn't, go back and listen to the series. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Can a person rob God? You are indeed robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In tithes and contributions. So as hard as this may be for you to hear this, if you're not giving faithfully through this church and you're in this church, you're robbing God. So you're a thief. I know that's harsh. So many of you have started to give, but there are still many, many who are not. Together, we can make a difference in the world. But that's just another example of how we struggle with stealing. There is also Barabbas was a murderer, but am I? Some of you are like, okay, preacher, that's where I draw the line. I mean, all right, may, maybe I've stolen a few things, but I'm not a murderer. Yes, you're a murderer. And here's the hardest reality. I remember reading Jesus' words for years, and then one day I'm sitting in a plaster shop where I'm pouring figurines, working for my mother-in-law, by myself. This is back in the mid 80s when we had a cassette player. Kids, ask your parents what that is. And I had the Bible on cassette and I would listen to the entire New Testament over and over. I listened to the New Testament 27 times in one year. That was the first time I heard these words instead of read them. And it was obviously dramatic. Jesus was speaking them. And look at this. You have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry, and by the way, this is hate, not just getting angry, angry with a brother will be subjected to judgment. And whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council. And whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. Now, obviously, We've all said fool. That's not what it's speaking of. It's speaking clearly. Jesus is saying, if you hate your brother, if you mock your brother, in those days, calling a person a fool was like a curse. It was like you're the court gesture, gesture idiot, okay? And so he's saying, you don't have the love of God in you. In 1 John 3, 15, it says, those who hate others are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life in them. Now, some of you may be sitting there going, uh-oh, I've got some hate in my heart. This doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means that the new nature in you, which cannot sin, is, been, is being corrupted by the old nature that still lives in you, in the flesh, the world, and the devil. And so you need the new nature to take control. That means forgive and move forward. You know, guys, all of that's difficult to hear, but it will help you understand and really grasp the amazing story of Christ's substitutionary death. Let me ask you this. Barabbas received undeserved grace. Do you agree? Can you? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. We all can. And in case you're a little confused, maybe you're thinking right now that you're already a believer and that this must be just a message to those who don't know Jesus, you would be gravely mistaken. Christians, friends, guys, I love you, but never come to the place in your life where you tire of the good news about Jesus Christ because it is the essence of all life. You know, Barabbas probably understood this. I want to believe that he did. There are some legends, we don't have any biblical fact, but there are some legends that say that Barabbas became a believer and then a follower of Christ and went on to share the gospel throughout Asia Minor. I, we don't know that for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. John 12, 32, Jesus said this before his crucifixion. And when I am lifted up from the earth, that was the cross, and draw all people to myself, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. 
In other words, when Jesus was lifted up, who was now in the crowd of free people? Barabbas. And he saw that Jesus was hanging on a cross, a cross that was intended for him. You know, when the crowd got so angry, they began to yell, give us Barabbas! Interesting, because just days before, even hours, they had never even given him a thought. He was in prison, and he was ready to hang on a cross, and they didn't care. And the truth is, they didn't care about him afterwards. They just hated Jesus, as you saw in Scripture, because they were envious of his influence, envious of his message, envious of his purity, sinlessness. It's an amazing reality. So, I ask you this, because the longer I'm a Christian and the longer I've been a Christian, I I question why in the world would Jesus die for me? I'm just like, God, why did you save me? I'm so wretched, so wicked. You know, I I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I take two steps forward spiritually and about 20 steps backwards the next day. If it's not getting frustrated, if it's not having some pride, there's always something. It could be lust. It could be greed. It could just be pure selfishness. That's an oxymoron, but you get the point. And yet God has been so gracious to me, and he's been so gracious to you. You know, many thought Jesus would be exalted to, a, to the throne and overthrow Rome. Because that's what they expected. That's because they missed Isaiah 53. They missed Genesis chapter 3. They missed the truth about Jesus coming to die for the world. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. Now, The curse is that every person born will die. And I'm going to tell you, in the last six weeks, I have lost or buried or both eight people. Our ministry has gone through this. Our family has gone through this. And I'm not talking about people that we were just cordially invited to. I'm not talking about people that we just happened to meet along the way. I'm talking... Six of these eight people we were super close to. When you understand the curse of sin and how it infects everybody, you start to understand the precious nature and the very short time that we have in this life. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of my mortality and have for decades been reminded of it. When you bury people you're always reminded of your own mortality. As a matter of fact, I can't help my mind. It starts talking inside my head. Uh, when is that going to be you? What, what, are your, what will your funeral be like? Well, you know, It's silly stuff like that, but you do it. Guys, Barabbas had to be thinking in his mind, <clears throat> why in the world would this good person be dying in my place? Picture it. He's in a prison, almost a dungeon. It's grimy. It's muddy. There's rats everywhere. He's chained to a wall. And suddenly, he's awakened in the middle of the night. He's probably already been struggling to sleep, thinking that his death was imminent and right around the corner. And he hears, give us Barabbas. He stands. He can't get all the way up. He's chained. And suddenly, the door opens. The jailer comes in undoes the chain shackles from his feet, and out he walks a free man. The time that he's walking free, he's thinking in his mind, what did I do to deserve this? In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I told you that I had a privilege of working around with some messages and kind of seeing behind the scenes before it was finished. Let me tell you a cool story. I've never shared this story. <clears throat> the man who played Barabbas was a man named Pedro I think it was Sarcucci or Sarbucci. And and Pedro was a non-believer when he started working on the Passion of the Christ. But he said after playing the role, studying the scriptures, and seeing Jesus die literally in his place, 
he converted to Christianity. He became a believer in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he saw what grace truly looks like. Now understand what's very important. All of us are sinners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of us are saved. Some of us are not. There are two types of sinners. There's the lost sinner. And the Bible makes it very clear that the lost sinner must come to a realization that they can do nothing to save themselves. All of us who are believers in Jesus Christ now, we came to that realization. We admitted our sinfulness, we understood it, and then we accepted the free gift of salvation. Look at Ephesians 2. For it is, but it is, it was, excuse me, only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. Nothing we did could ever earn his salvation, for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. Nobody's saved by being religious. If you're trying, you're on the wrong path. You're not even in the game. You cannot save yourself. Salvation has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what Jesus did and your willingness to believe he did it for you. So there's the lost sinner. That's what you must look to the cross and understand. As Barabbas, if you want to be free of the Barabbas in you, you've got to believe. For the saved sinner, we have the struggle every day with the flesh, the world, and the devil. I, I ran across a very self-righteous so-called pastor and, and, and it really has upset me because I've heard things that really trouble me. You know, when I hear people who are in the community of believers saying, I'm really tired of sin, I'm really disgusted by sinners, I, I'm thinking, dude, you're a sinner. We're all sinners, saved by grace. Look at this in Romans 7. If the Apostle Paul continued to struggle with sin like this, you and I will surely struggle with it. Look at this. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For I want to do the good, but I cannot do it. For I do not, I do, not do the good I want, but I do the very evil I do not want. Now, if I do what I want, do not want, it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. So I find the law that when I want to do good, evil is present with me. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this, because there were no chapters and verses when scripture was written, they were letters. The very next thought you'll find in Romans 8, verse 1, says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guys, that is the best news in the world. It's also reality. We are Barabbas. You're either Barabbas, lost in sin, destined for death, and you're going to die and spend eternity separated from God in hell, or you're Barabbas, saved, set free, and still struggling with your wretchedness. Now, I'm going to give you some final instructions today, okay, based on the life of Barabbas. Before I do, some of these may seem obvious, some of them may not, but I, I realized after collecting warning labels from different products that we overstate the obvious many times. Matter of fact, these are real warning labels, okay? On a hair dryer, literally says this. You might even have it on your hair dryer if you still have the tag. Do not use while sleeping. I want to meet those people, okay, who use their hair dryer while sleeping. How about this one? On a box of Cracker Jacks, you could be a winner. No purchase necessary. Details inside. Apparently, you have to steal it to actually get it because I don't know how that would work. On a bar of palm olive soap, directions, use like regular soap. Man, I'm glad they put that there. I was gonna eat it, right? Um, on the side of my frozen dinners, serving suggestion, defrost. I knew there was a problem, right? On the side of the iron, do not iron clothes on body. I won't even show you the scars, you know, but it, literally think about it. On nitol, a sleep aid, Literally, it says this, warning, may cause drowsiness. I hope so. That's why I bought it. On a Superman Halloween costume, wearing this garment does not enable you to fly. <laughs> I love that. On the side of a baby stroller, remove child before folding. 
Good news. I read that when we were in Disneyland and my grandkids are safe, right? On the box of the Apple iPod Shuffle, true story, do not eat Apple iPod Shuffle. <laughs> Hey, if you struggle with that, please do not buy an iPhone, okay? On the side of a Chipotle truck, true story, drivers do not carry burritos. They've, they've actually been uh, robbed at gunpoint thinking they had burritos. And I read this in Seattle, a 42-year-old man was ordering guacamole when he was told by the person behind the counter that it was extra. He pulled out a gun jumped over the counter, took the guy hostage, and proceeded at gunpoint to eat all of the guacamole. He was finally arrested. Everybody was safe. Somebody has an anger problem, and somebody had the runs that night in jail. Uh, That's just my guess. But anyways, some of these are obvious. And what I'm about to share with you, some may seem obvious, but there, there are a lot of times so obvious we miss them. So let me ask you this. How can you be free of the Barabbas in me? How can you be free of the Barabbas in you? Well, for the Christian, the Bible makes it clear. We got to be honest and live in a perpetual state of confession. Now, again, understand what this means, not what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you have to go through life, I'm so terrible, I'm awful, I'm the worst person. No, it's be honest, be transparent. I find freedom, maybe you don't, I find freedom in telling people, listen, I'm not perfect. I, I, you already see that. And, and I want you to learn from my mistakes. Isn't that what we do with our children? Or do you fake it? Do you tell your kids you're really good all the time and they think that? Listen, my parents are amazing people. I never saw them argue in my entire life. Then my wife and I started fighting three months into our marriage and I couldn't tell my parents. But years later, When I told my mom and dad that we had been having struggles and they found out, obviously, my dad's like, oh yeah, your mom and I argued all the time. What? When? Oh, we just went in the room. Nobody knew. Or we waited till you boys were gone. I'm like, don't do that. We needed to know you were human, right? First John says this, if we boast that we have no sin, we're not only fooling ourselves and our strangers to the truth, but if we freely admit our sins, when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ, and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we're not guilty of sin, when God uncovers it with his light, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, I need to tell you, Christian, that is written to the believer. I know some of you may have heard it shared for people who are not believers to come to Christ. That is wrong. It is for believers. And he says, when I'm faithful to communicate my sin, when I am in a constant state of confession, guys, I don't need to go to bed at night. Oh, Father, right now I just want to confess every sin. Let's see. Let's start in the morning. I got upset because my wife's in the bathroom too long. And then i driving. No, You know, I'm in a constant state of perpetual confession with God. Sometimes I'm driving him like, you jerk. Oh, God, sorry. God, sorry. And he's like, son, I love you. You're a bonehead, but I I think you guys have, you know, probably understood that I struggle with a little bit of driving issues, okay? Just be in a constant state of confession. How do we deal with that sin? Well, I wrote these words down many years ago, and I don't know where I heard them. They're not rocket science, but they will help you live in this transparent state. First, you got to own it before God and whoever you sinned with or against. Own it. Just own it. Man, people that don't own their faults drive me crazy. I, I might lose it. I might get mad. I might even try and justify it in the moment, but I promise you I'll be the first one to come back and own it. But people that never own it, wow. It's mind-blowing. you got to own it. So what have you done? What, where have you sinned? Have you violated your, your covenant in marriage? Have you violated your commitment at work? Have you violated God's law in some way? Own it and then avoid it next time by putting guardrails in place. Guys, you, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That is true of sin too. If I'm falling in a perpetual state of sin, then I got to quit putting myself there. I, I remember counseling a guy one time. He's like, yeah, well, you know, my wife and I aren't doing too good. I've had an affair. Oh, you've had one affair? 
I mean, that's bad. No, well, actually, two. No, uh, it was five. I'm like, man, you didn't just stumble into those. What are you doing? What happened after the first one? Oh, I kept having lunch with p- people at work. No, you don't do that. You struggle in that way. You don't go to lunch with a woman or a man of the opposite sex. I know we live in this society. Oh, there's no genders. That's a lie. Oh, we're not different. That is a lie. If you don't think men and women are different, you don't understand science. You don't understand psycho uh, analysis of our, our minds. You don't understand psychology. You don't understand scripture. And finally, offer it by sharing your story with others who may have similar struggles. One of the best things we can do is use our story for transformation. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. You might want to pay attention to these verses. And moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness. That is powerful from the guy Jason preached about last weekend who went from a, a, a dude that stuck his size 15 foot in his mouth all the time to a guy that was a powerful, moral godly individual, though not perfect. And for the Christian second, become consistently connected to those who love God and live for him. Now we talk about this a lot, but we don't talk about it enough. You're never going to be able to walk this life for the glory of God if you're not connected to the body of Christ. Look at Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. In contrast, associate with fools and get in trouble. Anybody want to give a testimony about that one from your home? We all could. So how do I walk with the wise? Let me give it to you real quick. Get in church. Now, I love that this happens to be on my message this weekend when we're not in the building that we often refer to as the church. But getting in the church means I am in fellowship with people. Look at Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I love that stir up. We get together, man, we motivate each other. It's exciting when we're all worshiping together. It's exciting when we're stirring each other up. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of so many now, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is that? The return of Christ, the second coming, and the rapture before that, which could happen any moment. So get in church, and second, go to small group. Go to small group. You know, the Bible is crystal clear. In the very first chapter of our uh, second chapter of Acts, the very beginning of the church, this is what we read. And day by day, attending the temple together, that's the big gathering, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. We need to get connected. You know where else you can get connected? We have a MOPS program here, Mothers of Preschoolers on Tuesdays, all right? Reach out to Lynn Chapman. Get involved in our MOPS program if you're a mother of preschoolers. You know what else? Uh, We have grace classes here. We have Celebrate Recovery on Wednesday nights. If you have ever struggled with a hurt, habit, or hang-up, I think that's all of us, get into Celebrate Recovery. Wednesday nights, 6 o'clock to 8.30, 9 o'clock. What else? We have our divorce care classes on Thursday night. Youth group on Tuesdays. If you are a teenager, if you're 12, you know, preteen to 17, 18, come to youth group. It is exploding with not only numeric growth, but with spiritual growth. It's amazing. Tuesday nights, get over here. They have clubs that meet before around 4 or 5 o'clock, and they go until 9 o'clock on Tuesday night. You know, there are so many ways in this ministry. I I think sometimes people have a hard time believing 
us when we tell them, you know, we really can't use our building for other things. And right now we have stretched our facility with all the memorials and some of the urgent stuff, but we just don't have a lot of time. Why? Because we're busy getting people connected. And finally, for the Christian, get baptized and start serving others. Now, I didn't necessarily put this in a specific order, because if I had, I'd have started with get baptized. But I'm ending with it because I want to challenge you. If you're a Christian and you've never gotten water baptized and started serving, you need to do this. Not just because I'm saying it, because this is how you as a believer are free of the Barabbas in you. Acts 10.47 says this, and it's a powerful passage because it distinguishes between receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation and being water baptized. Peter said this about Cornelius. Can anyone object to their being baptized, his whole family, now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? Anybody ever tells you that water baptism is part of salvation? Just go to that passage. And you can look here in Romans 6. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Now, this is a deep passage. Let me just sum it up very clearly. There is a baptism that takes place the moment you're saved. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no second blessing, no 50th blessing. There's infinite blessings. Holy Spirit comes in that moment. There is also water baptism, which demonstrates that we've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20, buried in the water and risen to walk in a new life. That, my friend, is why you get baptized. After Easter, we're going to have a big celebration. If you have never been water baptized as a Christian, some of you may have been water baptized as an infant. That doesn't count. You weren't a believer, okay? But if you are, want to be baptized as a believer, you've trusted in Christ, reach out to the church, call us at 720-895-9000, reach out through the website, uh, the app, let us know. We want to put you on the list. And for the unbeliever, how to be free from Barabbas and me? Admit you have sinned like Barabbas. That's the first key. You got to admit you're a sinner. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Guys, sin has separated us from God. You know, if, if you think of this glass of water, this is the pure holiness of God. This is the pure holiness of Christ. It is also like Adam and Eve when they were created. They were created without sin. So how much sin does it take to separate us from a pure, perfect, righteous, eternally good God. Well, it just takes one drop. Now, if I stir this up, you're going to see it changing the entire color of the water. Why? Because one drop of our sin makes it imperfect, impure. With God, he cannot dwell with sin. You know, if this was a glass of, of water and I put a drop of arsenic, it might look great to you. If you drank it, you'd die. In the same way, when we sinned, we were infected. We died spiritually and we will die physically. So what's the next thing I do after I admit my sin? I acknowledge I can do nothing to save myself. You know, I, I was talking about Galatians 2.20. For I've been crucified with Christ, and yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live not in the body, but I want to share verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Guys, you can't earn it. And Pastor Jim told me the coolest story. He said his brother Bob became a believer. I hadn't even heard this because of that verse. They'd grown up in Catholicism that preached works for salvation. And it was the first time he understood that you cannot be saved 
by anything you do. Otherwise, it makes Christ's death a joke. Romans eleven six 6 says, and it is by grace, if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And what is grace? It's getting what I don't deserve. And so I end with this. For the unbeliever, accept the free gift of salvation. Accept it. On Christmas, somebody comes out, gives you a gift on your birthday. They don't say, okay, that'd be $80. They say, just take it. It's yours. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I love Romans chapter 5. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through his other man, Jesus Christ. And by the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. You want triumph over sin? You tired of that life? You tired of being a victim to your own sin? Believe in Jesus. Accept the free gift and he'll save you eternally. And he'll set you on a path to triumph. Christians, Barabbas was a picture of Christ's substitution. I guess you could say Barabbas was truly the first person who Jesus died in his place. He was the first person for which Jesus died. And he died for the whole world. He died for everyone. You know, I mentioned many tragedies. And you know, the, the tragedy is this. If, if you become a believer like I just shared, and some of you will today, but you don't do what I shared for the, the lost or for the saved sinner, the Christian, then this life still brings agony and eventually misery. Years ago, 2013, a young man came to this church named James. Matter of fact, him and his dad I wrote about in my book, Grace Happens, in the fifth chapter, I believe. And it was a tremendous story, and I still believe and hold very clearly to the fact that they became believers in Jesus Christ, they were walking with the Lord, they had so much amazing potential. This past Friday, James um, died. And he died at the hands of, of an addiction. And the sad part in all of this is that he had so much still to do on this earth. But when we forget that we have a body of sin and we're all victim of it, any one of us, I don't judge James, I would never do that because I'm a sinner saved by grace. And the moment I decide I'm gonna do things my way, or I'm gonna go about things my way is when things go the wrong way. I want you to pray for James's father, Bruce, for his mother, Kim, his sisters, for his family, his uncle Les, who was a member of this church for nearly 10 years. And I want you to lift them up. And friend, I want you to know that if you're a Christian, be honest. Don't keep falling victim to this body of flesh in this world. And if you're not, trust in Jesus now. Let me have you just bow your heads where you're at. Don't turn this off. If what I just said made sense to you, then acknowledge your sin. Admit your sin. Acknowledge you can do nothing and accept the free gift. Just say this in your mind. God, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and I received the free gift of salvation. Friend, welcome to the family of God. We'd love to know who you are. Can't raise your hand, but you can text the word believe to 720-895-9000. Just text the word believe. 720-895-9000. We have a Bible for you. We want to welcome you to the family of God, but you're going to heaven. Christians, <clears throat> what do you need to admit? What do you need to confess? What do you need to be honest about? Who do you need to go to? Do you need to get in to fellowship? Have you been missing that? It's time. You need to get into a small group, mops group, uh, divorce care, celebrate recovery, the youth group. Do it. 
And understand this, God loves you. And he wants the best for you. And I love you. And I want the same. Father God, thank you for the free gift of salvation that has come to those who trusted in you and for the hope of your grace and mercy if we just honestly and openly live our lives in contrition and confession before you because you are so gracious. You don't beat us down. You don't make us feel worse. You lift us up and you tell us, son, daughter, you can get back up and move forward because a righteous person falls, but they get back up. We love you, God. We pray for the entire Butler family, for mercy and for grace. In Jesus' name, amen.